Good morning, saints. Hallelujah. Another glorious day that the Lord has made from the foundation of the world. And we do rejoice and we are glad in it. A great sunshiny day today here in western New York. The day before, uh, tomorrow will be the eclipse. Amen. And I guess it's going to go right over the center of our city. We're probably the more or the centerpiece of this um, event than anything else ever in history. So we'll find out tomorrow some of the transactions that, are, that may happen because of this. Um, there's a lot of symbolism on what's going on. There's a lot of spiritual you know, symbolism as well. There's a lot of things I could get into, but a lot of it is subjective. So there's no sense speculating. A lot of people say, you know, it could be the beginning of, you know, the end of a Jewish calendar and the beginning of uh, perhaps uh, the breakthrough of the church could start happening. I remember years ago, um, uh, there was a prophecy given by uh, Tommy Reed at the Full Gospel Ta uh, Tabernacle. He said, and the end times Buffalo would actually become a great epicenter of commerce. And um, because within a 500 mile radius of Buffalo um, is, over the, is over half the population of two nations, Canada and the U.S. And so a lot of people are thinking that because this is a turnaround year, that a lot of these things can start transpiring and happening. So <clears throat> that's quite an event. So we'll see what happens. Um, you know, just you know, stick, keep yourself in prayer. <clears throat> Make sure that there's no um, things that could happen to you know, bathe the nation and our city in the blood of the Lamb in your own neighborhood, <clears throat> you know, protect it from anything that could possibly go wrong, tectonic plates and all that, earthquakes, you know, bind that all up, <clears throat> send forth your angels, have some common sense you know, things in place. There's over 18 cities that are having their National Guard out. <clears throat> I don't think we have to worry about it because we have our supernatural guard out called, called the Body of Christ and the angels of Almighty God. Amen? So we're going to keep the destroyer in check by binding them up. So <clears throat> maintain your seating at God's right hand and realize that he has everything under control. <clears throat> and the righteous are not subjected to destruction, but actually deliverance and peace. Amen? So we're going to be starting again. This is uh, the Church Forever Part 5. This is April, uh, April the 7th, 2024. The Church Forever Free, Part 5, April 7th, 2024. We're going to be starting in the book of Ephesians. The Lord wanted me to tidy up a little bit of um, last week's teaching. And so we're going to do that. <clears throat> Hallelujah. There's something about the resurrection that he wanted to talk about that's a little bit more intense than what we covered. We covered a lot, but there's still some more good nuggets in there. Amen? <clears throat> now, if you understand, let's look at Revel, uh, Ephesians 1.19. It says this, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? So what Paul's talking about here is that when it, where, where it pertains to the resurrection, there had to be an exceeding greatness of his power. And it's to us who believe. So something happened beyond the norm of God's power. He had to you know, expend something greater, you know, by his doings than what you normally would ever have to do. I said last week that when God created a universe through Christ Jesus, when Jesus belted out those words, let there be light, and the whole universe is rocking and reeling under that command, um, you know, and it's still expanding. It was a great event, but there was no resistance to God's words. But because of this battle that had happened after the fall of um, Lucifer, and then, you know, Additionally, Adam, because of him, um, there's this great battle where the devil figured, I've got mankind in the grip of my hand, and I'm never going to let him go. And so, the, you know, the devil said, there's, I'm going to do everything I can to corrupt the seed of Jesus coming into the earth. So we saw what happened with the flood, you know, and so on and so forth. We saw with Herod, he tried to kill all the children so that Jesus could not be born here and be the sacrificial lamb and a great Messiah for both the Jew and and the Gentile believers, future believers that would be, amen, and the Savior of the whole world. And so this battle went back and forth, and you know when Jesus died on a cross and went to hell for three days and three nights, um, that battle was intense. I believe one day was for our spirit, the second day was for our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, and then everything that could happen in that arena, 
and the third was for our physical body. So the trinity and our triunus of, of man was handled by Christ in that great work. Amen? On the cross and the three days and three nights. So the devil got real nervous down there when he realized that he was schnookered by the sacrifice of the Father, how he roped him in, and he fell for the gullible sacrificial offering of a perfect innocent being, meaning Jesus, for the sacrifice of this, for all the sin of the world. And so he didn't want to let that church go, so he fought with all of his might, all of his power, but when Father made that annunciation at the end of the third day, you know, loose this man, this righteous man, meaning his son, and the body of Christ who was now attached to him, where the sin offering had made us righteous with Christ, when he got risen from the dead, you and I got risen from the dead, and the devil tried to withstand it, but he was no match. But it said here that the Father used exceeding great power to do that. And what is that exceeding great power? He goes on to explain that. Let's read it, verse 19. And what is this, what is this exceeding greatness of his power? Hmm? What is it? It's to us who believe. Believe what? Well, it's according to the working of his mighty power, which he needed or which he wrought when he rose up Christ Jesus from the dead. That's the power that he's talking about here. Okay? And not just Christ alone. You know, let your eyes descend down to chapter 2, verse 6, where it says that Jesus was risen up from the dead, but you and me too, together with him. So when we read verse 20 in chapter 1, we have to read that together. Christ was risen from the dead, and the whole body of Christ, to the devil's chagrin, you know, he'd go, oh man, I lost these people. We got risen too. And when Christ sat down, we sat down because the work was completed and done. So what I'm trying to get here is that there's this resurrection power that happened because of the resurrection of Christ in you and me. God made that power available to us to use in the future. He didn't want us just to use a normal grace, a normal anointing, a normal glory, but he wanted us to use this composite resurrection ability that, you know, that, that took a lot of the might of God to pull off. Now, there's something significant in all this. Remember what I've been telling you through all the teachings in the past year or two, that Jesus could not get out of hell, or you or me could not get out with him, unless everything was taken care of. Uh, all the sin was wiped out. All the sickness and disease was wiped out. Okay, Every tra you know, tragedy, circumstance, event, and, you know, in our life, in our historical life, of every man, woman, and child ever to be born on the earth was taken away. And Jesus would be stuck here even today, 2,000 years later, if it did not work. But it did work. So in composite within the resurrection power is all the deliverance of mankind. So I'm saying all that to say this. When you release the resurrection power out of the authority of your spirit and send it into an area or send it you know, into your own physical body... That resurrection power has already won the victory for you, already healed that sickness or disease, already cured you of that, of that debt or that onslaught from a negative standpoint or person out there. He's already done that. That Holy Ghost with the power of his resurrection and anointing already set us free. So there's no reason in the world the Lord told me you know, this week that we should ever stop using the resurrection power and use it in the fruit of our lips as we're making annunciations, as we're making declarations. We should be saying, you know, the power that's within me, I release this resurrection power against this situation and my physical body and my heart and my brains and my you know, organs and my tissues, my cells, my DNA, my genes, okay? Everything, everything about you, you release resurrection power because that's the power that rose you and Christ up from the dead after Father declared that everything was already won, that you already obtained the victory in every circumstance of life. That's the power. So when you use that power, it's sanctioning. You're telling God, I recognize what really happened in this resurrection. I'm also recognizing that it's keeping me on the right side of the cross. Okay, I'm on the side of where grace is reigning supreme. I'm in the New Testament when we're talking about resurrection. It's keeping you out of the law. You know, when we have a tendency to go by our own strength to pull off a victory, you know, we're basically telling God, I'm on the other side of the cross, I'm pre-cross. Well, then you're under the law, you're under Satan's jurisdiction. He can do whatever he wants to block that prayer and frustrate you. So the devil says, okay, if I've lost these beings due to grace, due to them using faith, and, you know, by the power of the resurrection, all that, the least I can try to possibly do to attain all that is to sow some mixture of the law into this New Testament grace. 
By doing that, I'll contaminate the whole situation. Okay? Doesn't take much to contaminate something that is pure. It's something that is, you know, pristine pure, and you put one small little contaminant within it, it's no longer pure. Because that contaminant is there. It's not going to go anywhere. You know, Paul says it in Galatians 3, just a little leaven, just a little false doctrine, just a little bit of mixture leavens a whole lump of grace. Just a little bit. So the devil, all he has to do is get a little bit of that mixture in you, and it cancels out all of our prayers. That's why the teaching here, the church forever free, is big. This is a big one, saints, that we're going that we're teaching here. So it says here in verse 19, <clears throat> it's according to the to us who believe, believe in the resurrection, that it happened, and it included you and me. That's what we believe. But it was according to the working of his mighty power, not just his normal power, but his mighty power, the exceeding greatness of his mighty power, which he wrought when he raised Christ, and then you go down to Ephesians 2 6, Christ and you and me from the dead. So now that's what we have. We have, in, uh, you know, at our disposal, we have in our toolbox, okay, resurrection power that we've hardly ever used in our declarations that can obliterate, that, that is the most, in other words, when we use resurrection power, you're using all the power of God at once. You're not using a smidgen of it. You're not getting a little bit of, you know, this or a little bit of that. You're using the, uh, you know, the big one, you know, the big bomb that can cause signs, wonders, and miracles to happen in your life, okay? And the devil doesn't want that out there. You know, the Holy Ghost uh, so eloquently said in Romans, you know, 8, 11, because that same spirit that rose up Christ from the dead dwelleth in you, he that rose up Christ from the dead also quickens, that's a resurrection term, or makes alive, he quickens your mortal body by his spirit that dwells. So what quickens or makes alive your mortal body? If your body organ is, has a disease in it, it needs to be made alive or resurrected to the what? To the performance and image and likeness of that of Christ Jesus' organ. <clears throat> so we're, what we're doing is releasing resurrection power into that bodily organ so that it comes into conformity to the what? To the perfect body of Christ. And we'll go over that verse in a minute. There's also a great verse in Philippians 3.21 where it says that he's able to take our vile body or organs who are out of whack, okay, he's able to take our vile body and change it into his glorious body. Well, how does he do that? Through the resurrection power. Okay, so we'll cover that verse in a moment as well in depth. Okay, so hang on to your seats here. We're going to cover a lot of good things in a moment. Okay, now... <clears throat> So in verse 20, this exceeding power was released into you and to me when God rose Jesus and you and me up from the depths of hell and then made us to sit at his own right hand. How about that one? Okay, He said, there's nothing more for you to do. I don't want you to work anymore because that would flip you over to the wrong side of the, of the cross. You just sit down and maintain the New Testament side in grace, in faith, in my righteousness, and I'll break all things towards you and for you. Okay? <clears throat> verse 20, which he wrought in Christ in you and me when he raised him and you and me from the dead, verse 20, and set him and you and me at his own right hand in heavenly places. Well, I don't see where it says in you and me. Go back to chapter 2, verse 6. Talked about where Christ and you and me were risen from the dead. So I'm paraphrasing that. I'm including that in there. Okay? So he raised us up from the dead by this resurrection power and then he did another miracle by resurrection power. He made us to sit at his own right hand. Sit down. Okay? You're going to allow me to be a father and a God unto you. I want to make the performance of all things into your life again. I lost that in the garden when you chose to go another way through Adam. But now I can finally get back to being a God unto you and a father unto you and make a provision for you. That is my intent. <clears throat> and look what it goes on to say here at his own right hand in heavenly places, verse 21, where we put you by this resurrection power. This, this is what happens when you have this inside of you. You're now far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that has a name, not only in this world, but also in the world which is to come. So everything, that God assigned a name to everything. Okay. Now some names of things are great, some names of things are neutral, and 
iffy. Some names are bad things that are in life, but they have been given a name for an identification purpose. But no, it doesn't matter whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, you are sitting in a positional place in God far above all these. Above every demonic host that exists, you are so far above them, they are so beneath. In fact, God destroyed these beings' power against you and put them all underneath the feet of the body of Christ, which I'll show you in the next couple of verses here, so that the whole kingdom, everything that has a name, including the whole kingdom of darkness, and every demonic name and spirit has been placed under the feet of the body of Christ. To what end? So that when you use your resurrection power, they will come into conformity to the declaration that you're enunciating. We'll get into these examples in a moment. <clears throat> so we're far above everything that has a name. Okay, every look at what it says. Far above all principalities, all powers, and mights, and dominions. Those are angelic forces on the bad side. And every name that is named, okay? Not only in this world, because a lot of people say, oh no, Pastor, that's relegated to when we get to heaven. No, no, it says right there. Not only in this world, but also in the world which is to come. So why are we letting a name defeat us when the greatest name and the highest name in the universe is the name of Jesus? Which he said in Philippians you know, 2, 9, 10, 11, that there is no greater name. Okay? That at the name of Jesus, every knee of every demonic spirit will bow its knee before Jesus and pay homage to him. Say, yes, you are Lord, you have dominion over me, and I now serve you. I can't do anything about it. So he's given us his name, he's given us his resurrection power, he's given us his position, he's given us his seating. There's no way that you could capitulate and lose unless you don't know these things. <clears throat> okay? And then in verse 22, he climaxes this whole thing by saying this, and now he, and now he hath put, see that word hath, H-A-T-H? He hath put all things in existence on all three realms, heaven, earth, and under the earth. He has put all things under his feet. Whose feet? The body of Christ. Jesus is, you know, we're his body. The feet are on the body. And he gave him, Jesus, to be our head. Amen, he is. Amen, praise God over all things to the church. So Jesus took all the dominion that he won back from Adam and turned right around and gave it right back to the body of Christ the way it was in the garden before Adam fell. <clears throat> okay. He put all things over, you know, gave all things to the head, Jesus, and then he put all things underneath the church, verse 23, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. God is incomplete without the church. But now that the church has been born again, and that we are new creations grafted into Christ Jesus himself, he is now full and complete again. Okay, You might say, well, God never needed man. He was already full and complete without him. He was. But when he made the declaration that he wanted to have man in his image and likeness and have a family, the minute he then made that statement, <clears throat> you know, it took away from the first priority that he was self-sufficient within himself. Now God was self-sufficient, but he now has a body that he also wants to be attached to. Okay, if Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says that God, all the fullness of the Godhead is in the body of Christ. So now God's fuller or complete because the church is now one with him. Amen. And then again, 2, 6 says, and he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, how did we get there? By power, by a resurrection type power. Okay, I said all that <clears throat> to set you up. So let's get into some of these interesting concepts. The power of God's resurrection is to be used by the church to overcome every event, circumstance, and situation in life. Every one of them. God didn't want you to go through life without using the resurrection power. <clears throat> let's, um, let's look at Philippians, which is the next book over. <clears throat> Chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Where it states here, this is Paul talking, and I listen carefully, and be found in him, meaning in God, in Christ Jesus, wherever you see the word in him, it's always talking about Jesus Christ, okay? And being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, 
So anytime you try to do anything apart from God's grace and finished work in Christ, you're automatically default under the law. You're placed under the law. And being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is of the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Okay, faith is something that you cannot see, but you exp- you know you say by the authority of my spirit, I choose to believe. I acknowledge that that's really real. I believe that that's more real than what my eyesight or ear gates or senses tell me that is right or wrong. Amen? Now look at verse 10 here. <clears throat> Paul, Paul is telling you in verse 9 that I've got this God-given righteousness. It came through the righteousness of faith by the grace of Almighty God. But then look at this capsulation in verse 10. That I may know him. Well, why, does, why do we need to know him? Not just in the fact that you're born again. But that you want to get you know, into the intimacy with God. You want to get into that intense secret place within him. That I may know him. Now once I get to know him, I'm going to understand the revelation of what he's trying to get over to me, which I'm preaching to you today. Okay, God's going to make revelation to your spirit and illumination to your mind as we get more intense into him. God automatically is a giver. He's going to continue to show you who he is and what he is to, to you. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Ooh. So, in other words, if we don't understand or if we're not utilizing the power of his resurrection, it's laying dormant. When you get to know Christ and his ways of doing things, automatically it's going to encapsulate and use resurrection power. How do you think Jesus raised all these people from the dead when he did his earth walk? How do you think he walked on water? How do you think he cast out devils? How do you think you know he healed the sick? You know, the blind, the lame, the halt, everything through resurrection power. But he hadn't died yet. Yes, he did. He was a lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Amen? So he was using the ability that the church now has. So Paul says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection. Okay? So if God wants us to know, understand the power of his resurrection, how to use it, that's what I need to teach you today. That's what we didn't talk about last week. Okay? Then it goes on to say, and everybody takes this next part of the verse, and they go, well, that doesn't sound good. It sounds excellent. We understand the right interpretation of it. Look at the rest of the verse. <clears throat> that, I may under, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Oh, does that mean that if Christ suffered, I have to, I have, to have fellowship with his suffering, and suffer whatever he suffered? Just the opposite is true. The fellowshipping of his sufferings is identifying what, with what he suffered for you on, be, you know, on your behalf. So whatever he suffered, then we reciprocally take the benefit of what he bore away so that we could walk free. You know, I put something in my margin many, many years ago, and I wrote, the fellowship of his sufferings means this, God has his part to do the suffering, your part is to receive his part, which was the deliverance and the benefits that you got from it. You get it? He suffered at the whipping post by a stripes you were healed, not so that you could also suffer with that same disease, but also to be healed of and from that disease. Do you see that? So whatever he suffered for, he did it on your behalf so that you wouldn't have to. Now, it didn't say that you were exempt from suffering persecution or being ridiculed you know, by the world system for your faith. They're always going to do that. The devil's always going to whip up you know, people who are blind to the truth yet. But it's talking about the sufferings that he paid the price for so you wouldn't have to, you know, bear whatever he took for you on your behalf. And it goes on to say this, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. In other words, I fellowship with you, Lord. I saw what you did for me. I saw what you bore. I saw what you did in your sacrifice. I saw what happened on the cross where you became me, and then I became you in the resurrected side. I see where the Lord that I now should live out the victorious life that you obtained for me. I saw what happened when you went to hell for three days and three nights and redeemed the body of Christ down there. I, I, you know, that's part of fellowshipping with his suffering. I'm fellowshipping, I'm acknowledging, I'm seeing what you suffered for, what you bore for, what you died for, what you paid the price for, that you left the splendor of all divinity in heaven to come down and die for me and the church and the whole world for that matter. Amen? Paul considered it dung that he made, he, he, you know, Paul had a life, he had a lot of prestige, he had a lot of preeminence because he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, 
But he goes, I count all that as dung, that I may know Christ and win him, and that I may win souls because of that you know, revelation that I have of him. And Jesus says the same thing. I count the splendor of heaven and, and all the glory that I have on, uh, up here as dung too, that I may come down there and win my church back unto me. Okay? I want my body back unto me. Paul made that declaration that I just talked about in verse 8 above. So let's go on in that same verse. The fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. In other words, realize what he bought and paid for you in that death. So, you know, because Christ died, we die no more, it says the Bible. Okay, the Bible says we don't die anymore. We pass from life to life. We just go from this life and we springboard into the next life. But I believe that we're the rapture generation. I mean, the signs of the times are all around us. I believe that we are going to cheat the undertaker. Okay? That's what I really believe. Hallelujah. Well, what if Jesus takes too long? Well, then then be like Enoch. Enoch didn't wait for the rapture. And he got raptured. Okay, then be like, um, you know, Elijah. He didn't wait for the rapture and he still got raptured. If what, you know, you get what you believe with God. No more, no less. Okay? So it goes on, it says here, and being made conformable unto his death. Okay. So he's able to change my vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, to the working whereby he's able to what? Subdue all things unto himself. So any death that's working within me, he can subdue it. He's conquered it. Who is death, burial, and resurrection? And now I can what? Spring those bodily organs into life. Where are you getting at? Verse 21. Look at verse 21. Same chapter. He's able to change our vile body through that resurrection power, okay? That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So anything that's vile in you <clears throat> that is not lined up to his glorious body, if your eyesight's not lined up, if you're prematurely aging, that's not lining up. If you've got a spot, wrinkle, or blemish, that's not lining up. Anything in your physical body that's not you know, lining up to the perfected body as Jesus is today, he's able to take that vileness, he considers it vile, that it's not lining up to his own body. Remember, there's only one body, the scripture says in Ephesians 4.4. 4. Okay? And we're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. And it says that he's able to take our vile body and fashion it like unto the Lord Jesus' glorious body. When? Here in the earth. Oh no, Pastor, that's talking about the glorified body. No, it's not. It says it right there. He's able to take our vile body and bring it into conformity to his glorious body. Remember, as he is now, so are we in this world, not when we get to heaven. We're going to get the glorified body too. Amen. But as he is now, today, with a glorified body, so shall we be in this world with a glorified body. Not the glorified body where we walk through walls. I'm talking about we can have the glory that flows within him and through him by using his resurrection power. Let's finish the verse. Who is able to change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Because all things are connected to him. He's the creator of all things, but he's also the creator of the body of Christ, his own body. So he's able to subdue those things that are out of divine order and bring him, remember, through the blood of the cross, he's able to reconcile all things. Remember Colossians talked about that? <clears throat> remember that? one? I think it's chapter 1, verse 20. Okay. And so it says here he's able to take this vile body and conform it. Okay? Conform it and change it and subdue all things unto himself. So he brings that defective bodily organ and brings it to himself. That could be a defective kidney, defective, you know, stomach, defected heart, defective lungs. And what? Bring it into conformity to that of his own body. How do you do it? Resurrection words. Father, I take, I know and I recognize that through the resurrection of, of the body of Jesus Christ himself, that he's conformed all things back unto himself. He's brought all things back into conformity to his own glorified body. He's reconciled it to himself. So I release resurrection power into that bodily organ so that now it emulates and represents Jesus' glorified body. Hallelujah. <clears throat> praise God forevermore. Okay, now, praise his name forevermore. Now, I wrote something else down here in the notes. It says here, 
What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? Okay, now listen to this carefully. The exceeding greatness of power that we have in us today is the, um, is, is the resource and power. I can't even read my own writing sometimes, okay? The exceeding great power we have in us today is a resurrection power of God raising Christ and us from the dead. Now, you may say, Lord, I don't know you know, which, you know, how to solve this problem. Let's say you're going through something in life and you just don't have any idea how to get from point A to point Z. You've done everything that you know how to do that you've been taught, you know, biblically and so on and so forth. Say, Lord, I, you know, I know you've got the wisdom and you can impart that, direct, that directional wisdom into me, but I, all I know is that you know what to do. In fact, so much so that the resurrection caused you to heal that situation or bring that situation into conformity. Amen? So that same power that's in us, that same resurrection power in us that God used in raising Christ from the dead and us from the dead, say this, Lord, I don't know how you're going to solve this situation, fix it or heal me, but that's irrelevant. But I know that your resurrection power has already done it. Your resurrection power has already brought you and me into this absolute conformity. Amen? It's done it, Lord. So now I release this resurrection power into every arena of my life. I use resurrection power to heal my my nation, heal my land, heal my government, you know, protect us from onslaughts of the evil one, to deliver us from evil. I'm using that resurrection power to bring us into total conformity of that my body is now into your perfected standard. I am now the righteousness of God based on your resurrection power. I use that resurrection power when I lay hands on the sick and they always recover. That it's the same spirit, the same power that rose Christ in you up from the dead. See, when you lay hands on somebody and you release resurrection power, the resurrection power already looks at that person and says, I already healed them when I, came, when I brought them up from the hell and made them to sit at God's right hand. So the resurrection power knows what it did and knows what to do. It knows how to bring that person into the total harmony and equalization of what he already did and accomplished for you. Are you getting this? Hallelujah, saints. The resurrection power. You use it for all things and everything in life. God Almighty, I'm telling you, God loves this. He loves what, when we talk about what He's done and what He's do, you know doing through the anointing that He's already put within you. I thank you, Lord, that I'm under. I can't be defeated. The resurrection power has already raised me up from the dead. It's already made me to sit at God's right hand. It's already put all things underneath my feet. This resurrection power causes hell to shudder. Amen. Let's look at Romans um, 8.11 real quick. I told you I quoted that verse. <clears throat> Let's glance over there real, real fast. Romans 8.11. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Paul's talking about walking in the Spirit. He says here, but if the spirit of him, meaning the, of, of, of God, okay, but if the spirit of him that raised Jesus up from the dead, God raised Jesus up from the dead, dwell in you, and he does, okay, amen, he dwells in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, or that word makes alive, your mortal bodies by his spirit which dwelleth in you. Do you realize how powerful of a statement that is? He's talking about the resurrection power of God there. But if the spirit of him that raised, 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 that's a resurrection term, that raised Christ and you and me from the dead, dwelleth in you, that same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead, who dwells in you, he's now able to quicken. That word quicken is also a resurrection term. That make alive, bring into conformity. You know, to a super surge of powers, God's power and anointing inside you. He's able to what? Quicken or make alive your mortal body. Remember, remember what it said in Timothy. We've been preaching this. Timothy 2, I believe, chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, where it says that death has been abolished and everlasting life and immortality has been established. So mortal, mortality is not immortality, is it? So he's able to take that which is mortal and change it into what? That which is immortal. Amen. Because the scriptures have to come into conciliation and to conformity with one another. Amen, saints? So he's able to change our vile body that it may be fashioned unto the Lord Jesus' glorious body. Amen. We talked about that in Philippians 2, I'm sorry, 321. 
So he's now, he raised up Christ and you and me from the dead, and he's quickening our mortal bodies by his spirit. So the spirit of God is surging. The Holy Ghost is resurrection power surging up and down all day long, all day long, waiting on, on, on you to make a declaration and making a demand on its availability and its power to be released here into the earth. And it never stops going up and down, but it's latent, it's dormant, unless you do something about it. Even though it's there and it's made available, it doesn't, it doesn't work for you, you know, automatically. You have to say words. Words dominate the laws here, the spiritual laws here in the earth. Amen? So I release this resurrection power to surge through my body. Give me supernatural divine energy. Give me a supernatural compilation of all of God's intellect and wisdom, knowledge, so that I can walk in the glory of all of his affairs. Amen? That I can have keen insight into what he does. I release this resurrection power into my workplace. I have favor between God and Almighty and in all men, and this resurrection power goes before me. See, resurrection power means that God, he used the power to make sure every opponent and adverse effect and circumstance that was arrayed against you was conquered by his resurrection power. So use the same power to enforce that defeat of that Satan has incurred now by God. Amen? So when you use the resurrection power, the resurrection power is, knows he's boss. He goes into that situation and says, I already saw that this was going to attack this Christian believer in Christ. And I already defeated it in, you know, in hell. I defeated it and saw it. And I said it to this believer's account. He's already free. They're already free. They're already free. And every year in our life, you're already free. Amen? So no matter what attacks you say, I'm already free. This resurrection power surging in through my whole physical body. It's, it's, you know, I'm, and, and if you've got a problem with a certain bodily organ or function, you talk about it. I release the resurrection power through my heart, my lungs, you know, every part of my body, my circulatory system is, is, is supercharged by the energy of this resurrection power. And I thank you, Lord, for the glory of it. I've been using it here and there a little bit this week, and I've been seeing some things change. You know, some things, results, breakthroughs, and things that were stubborn before. Okay, so it's starting. So God wants us to know this, and that's why he didn't let me go into where we need to go, you know, in our teaching, the Church Forever Free. This is part of that Church Forever Free. Okay, because we're talking about the resurrection, not the law. We're talking about grace, amen, and the righteousness of God. And every time you use the resurrection power of God, you're keeping yourself on the right side of the cross and in the New Testament. <clears throat> if you go, Lord, I don't know what to do here, you're putting yourself back under the curse, under the Old Testament. Why would you want to go there when the resurrection power has already won it for you? That resurrection power has already given me the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Resurrection power means victory, triumph, success, favor, abundance, blessing, and it keeps you in that seated position of rest we can allow God to work for you and be a God and a Father unto you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah forevermore. Praise God. <clears throat> so I think you get the picture. Okay? So now, let's change gears just slightly and go back into the, the meat of what we've been talking about. How, the, how God wanted the church never to have even tasted the law, let alone be exposed to it in the first place. And we've been talking about how, you know, the church came into that, you know, by, you know, people and ministers and you know doctrines over the eons of time it was so easy to talk about it. they just figured because the old testament was attached to the new testament and somebody handed somebody a bible that it was must have been something that we both have to study and i've been telling you that it's got no more to do with us than the man on the moon you know the mosaic law we saw it in acts chapter 15 and uh you know go over parts one through uh four to get a you know an update on that, so let's go today <clears throat> to Second Corinthians chapter three. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians three. <clears throat> Verse two. Hallelujah. This is Paul writing to the Corinthian church. And he says here, You are our epistle 
written in our hearts, known and read of all men. <clears throat> See, the epistles of the Old Testament were written on tablets of stone and all the other manuscripts. You had to go and reference them somewhere, okay? But Paul's saying the New Testament believers are living epistles, read of all men. They could say but by what they do, but what they hear, how they act. When they lay hands on the sick and they recover people, they can see what's going on here. Known and read of all men, verse 3, 2 Corinthians 3, 3. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, or the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, okay, Old Testament, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, but in the fleshly tables of our heart. Okay, let's keep reading here. Notice how Paul goes back and forth. Law, grace, law, grace, law, grace. Okay, law and the Spirit. Verse 4. And such trust have we through God, through Christ to Godward. We have trust in what his redemptive act did to Godward. Verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves, back to the law, okay? But our sufficiency is that of, our, of God. That's who we're sufficient of. He's my sufficiency. I can do all things in and through and by him, amen? Verse 6. Who also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not the old, mixed in with the new. He says, we are, a, we are who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. <clears throat> Paul's making it as clear as he possibly can. Okay? And he knew that Judaizers were listening and you know reading these epistles too that he sent out. Who has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter. The letter always means in Old Testament, but of the Spirit. You got born again of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost did it. For the letter killeth. You hear that? But the Spirit gives life, gave you eternal life. The letter's designed, the Ten Commandments were designed to grind people into powder, to crush them, and to kill them. In other words, to come into an end of themselves, to where they would say, Lord, we need a Redeemer. Well, you may say, well, the people of the Old Testament didn't have Jesus, but well, they had him in shadows and types. That's what the high priest was all about. So their, their solace in the Old Testament was to go and have offerings done by calves, bulls, sheep, goats, and such. And these sacrificial offerings gave them relief. It was temporary, but at least gave them a, you know, a temporal relief. Amen? Let's read 6 again. Who, who also has made us ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth. So don't hang on to it, saints. Make sure you'll kill but the Spirit giveth life. Now here's a key verse, verse 7. <clears throat> now he's talking about the law here in the first sentence. But if the ministration of death, well, what is death? Let verse 6 tell you what death is. Let's go back to verse 6 again. Right in the middle. Okay. Or the New Testament of the letter of the Spirit. For the letter, or meaning the Ten Commandments, killeth. The letter killeth. Okay, we'll read 7 now. But in the ministration of death, okay, the letter, and it goes on to define it, written and engraven in stones, the Ten Commandments, those two tablets that Moses came down Mount Sinai with, right? He calls, he calls the Ten Commandments, or the law, the ministration of death. Now, how many people love those, you know, that mixture? They love mixing the Ten Commandments and all that those, you know, that so-called moral compass that you have to do with what they do today and try to mix law and grace. He says, you're so in death into you. Remember how I started this teaching? Remember the prophecy that the Lord said on tape in the first message? He goes, the number one thing that is killing the body of Christ is mixture. The number one thing that's keeping people from getting answered prayer is mixture. <clears throat> okay? It's the number one thing. All right? Let's read 7. But if the ministration of death, which was the Ten Commandments, okay, was glorious, it had a, a glory. What was the glory? To bring people to an end of themselves so they would go run to the high priest and get relief. Okay? So it had a glory in it. It would, could keep the people covered. 
and protected once that sacrifice was given. So let's read it again. But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious, so that which the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses. Remember, Moses was before God for 40 days and 40 nights. He saw the very presence of Almighty God, that his whole body was in a sheen of God's glory. And yet, you know, isn't it interesting that he came down that mount with the glory of God on his face and, held, and had the law in his hands? What a contradiction. I mean, in other words, God, even to the very last minute, was beckoning the children of Israel to do one thing. You see the glory that's on Moses' face? Choose that rather than these two tablets that he's contain, having here. Choose that. Choose the glory over the two tablets of stone. So let's go on. Okay. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was, glor was glorious, it had a minimal glory, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. They still had a chance. They could have said, Moses, forget it. No, we still want to go, but we want to go by the grace of God. We're going to go by what he can do for us, not by what we can do for him. They, then Moses would have taken those two tablets and thrown them on the ground. He did it once when he saw the golden calf. Okay? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Let's, let's read on here. But they could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. Which glory, though, even that first inner glory, were he had the Ten Commandments in his hand, was to be done away with. The Ten Commandments, which represented the Old Testament, was to be done away with. That's right there, which was to be done away with. Which was to be done away with. Which was to be done away with. Verse 8. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit, meaning the Holy Ghost, being born again to the Spirit and by faith, be rather more glorious, the Greek says, be rather a greater glory. Look at 9. Back to the Old Testament here. But if the ministration of condemnation, which was the law, the law always condemned you, tried to get you to end yourself so you'd reach out and look for, for you know, in our case, the Messiah, Jesus, all right? In their case, they had to go to a high priest. I want you to tie two verses together right here. Look at the first sentence in verse 7 again. But if the ministration of death, now go drop down to 9, but if the ministration of condemnation, both talking about the law, so the law represents the ministration of death and condemnation. Do you want to be under that? Do you like that ministration of death and condemnation? Do you, do you, you know, do you love to have that plaque on your wall, the Ten Commandments still? Hmm? Do you love that curse? Paul called it a curse in Galatians 2, 3.13. He said, you know, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. The law was a curse, not a blessing, saints. Amen. Verse 9. But if the ministration of condemnation, death and condemnation, be glory, had a minimal glory, okay, much more, much more, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed, far exceed, the New Testament far exceeds whatever the, the law presupposed to do, which would put you under death and condemnation. Verse 10, For even that which was made glorious, the First Testament, the Old Testament, but really had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that exceedeth or was to come, which was the New Testament. It had really no real glory. The glory is what happens when God made you one with himself. Verse 11, For if that which was done away, the Old Testament glory, or the Old Testament in itself, look at, what, look at this wording, saints. For if that which was done away, it was done away, Hammer that in your head and mind. It was done away. Don't hang on the mixture. Okay, it was done away. If that which was done away was glory, or had a minimal glory, much more that which remaineth, the New Testament, is, is rather what? More glorious. Amen? Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Verse 13, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, now this is interesting. This glory was so strong on Moses' face he had to put a veil over it because his countenance was almost like looking at the eclipse without eyeglasses. Okay, it could be injurious. 
So he put this veil. <laughs> what he's saying is he's coming down the mount. Do you want to choose the glory? Or do you want to have the veil put over the glory so you can't see the true glory? The true glory was what? God alone being your righteousness through his grace and through faith and by the power of his spirit. Okay? So he put a veil and said, you know what? If you choose when I'm holding in my hand these two tablets of stone, there's going to be a veil over your eyes so that you can't see the real glory anymore. You're going to always go and default to the false glory, the Ten Commandments. Let's keep reading. <clears throat> Verse 13, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look, could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. Did you get it? Yeah. Look at it again. They could not steadfastly look to that which was abolished. What was that to be abolished? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. That which, which is to be abolished. So, by putting that veil over, Moses already knew what they were going to choose. Let's read on. <clears throat> Verse 14. But their minds were blinded. Now why were their minds blinded? By that same veil. The veil covered up the true glory and showed them the fake glory. The Ten Commandments of the law. Let's read 14. But their minds were blinded. Look at this. For until even this day, today, saints, their minds remain blinded the same, watch, I'm going to read that again, but their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil, the same veil of the law, who's covering up the reality and the truth, okay, remaineth the same veil, untaken away in reading of the Old Testament. Did you just hear that? Every time you read the Old Testament, you're putting a veil over you. Now do you love the Old Testament? Now there's some great scriptures. I'm going to teach you how to New Testamentize every Old Testament verse that you love. You tell me which one you love, then I'll tell you how to make it into the New Testament. Okay? Now I'm not saying it's wrong to read it as a historical notion or a historical fact, how God did his dealings with the children of Israel and how blessed the Psalms and the Proverbs are and all those, you know, the major and minor prophets and all that. That, that's all good reading, and there's a lot of great scriptures that you and I have used in the past, and if we New Testamentize them, they're right. They're righteous to use. Okay? But he's saying here, <clears throat> this veil you know, remains you know, to these people untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. You're, you're, you're on really shaky ground, because you know what's going to happen when you keep reading the Old Testament instead of just the epistles, which were written to you and me in the New you know what's creeping in there? Mixture. Grains and granulars of mixture get dotted in there. Like a pepper shaker, just a little bit of mixture. Okay? Just a little bit. <clears throat> Hallelujah. <clears throat> mixture, mixture, mixture. Now watch this. Let's read that last phrase again. And that same veil on taken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away with or taken away in Christ. So when you're born again, the veil's ripped off and now you can see the true glory. Whew. The true freedom. The true liberty. The New Testament. Okay? Read 15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, you want to go back to that Old Testament and read more Moses, more of that law? The veil remains upon their heart. Do you want to gamble? I'm not saying not to read it, but read it with the right context. Not to put it, you know, apply it in your life as mixture, works and so on and so forth, but understand the power of what the New Testament did. It delivered you from that. Okay? 15 again, but even to this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. 16, nevertheless, <clears throat> when, the, when they should turn to the Lord and get born again, I'm paraphrasing this, the veil should be taken away. The veil is the law that's blinding their eyes to the truth. Verse 17, now the Lord is that spirit. You know, that, that new, you know, he comes into your heart when you're born again. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, not bondage, not death and condemnation, but freedom, everlasting life, and immortality. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. But look at 18 as we close the teaching. But we all with an open face. Open face means no veil. But we all who are New, New Testament Christians... 
new creation Christians, we don't have a veil. But we all with an open face. Our face is open, no veil. Okay, we can see clearly what is the truth. Amen? But we with an open face, beholding as in a mirror, we behold as in a mirror. See, when you don't have a veil on, you know what man or a man or woman you really are. Okay? You're not deceived by a mixture of the law. But we with an open face or without a veil, beholding as in a mirror or a glass, the glory of the Lord. We see the true glory. Remember we've been talking about a, a, a previous glory? And then he goes, there's a latter glory? Where are the latter glory? Not the glory or the ministration of the Ten Commandments. Look what it, how it finalizes the verse here. We look in a glass or a mirror, we see the true glory of the Lord, the New Testament glory, and we are changed into that same image, going from, look at this, going from glory, Old Testament, or the law, Okay, going from glory to glory, the second glory is the New Testament. So we went from the old glory, which was minimal, to the new glory, once we got born again. Isn't that beautiful? Even as by the Spirit of the Lord, the Lord did it. The Lord took the veil. He makes it, well, we, but we weren't under the law. We were under the law of Adam's fall, though, you know, and that was still a veil to a degree, by our own, oh, I could get to, talk to a sinner today, I can get to heaven by my own works. Okay, then why did Jesus, you know, there was no necessity to have Jesus die on the cross then for you. He came for nothing then, right? But there was a necessity, and that's the truth, amen? So if a person goes by their own works, they're automatically defaulting them under the law of Moses, even if they never even read one sentence of it. But thank God we've been delivered, saints. And that's why the importance and the import of this teaching of so treasured. Let's unhook there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for this message. We praise you. We bless you. We worship you and adore you. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord God, for the revelation into our spirit, illumination to our minds. And we just thank you, Lord God, that the resurrection power surges through us, Lord, surges through us and gives us relief and breakthrough in every arena of life. We give you the thanksgiving, Lord God, for supernatural retention, memory, and recall. And we do bear fruits of righteousness concerning this. Again, my eternal prayer is the same one every week that the saints will go over this lesson over and over and over till they get it down and understand it. Praise God. And that only happens that way, saints. Sorry. There's no shortcut. You may understand it today, and then three days later, I'll say, let's talk about the message, and you'll be dumbfounded. Okay? But, so that's why faith cometh by hearing and hearing, and keep hearing the word of Christ, the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Well, the word God there is the word Christos. Actual faith cometh by hearing the words of Christ, the revelation of Christ, and what he did for us. Amen? That kind of faith. Not putting trash inside of us, but the word of the Spirit of God. Amen? <clears throat> All right, so let's get together our, our communion, and then we'll do the tithes and offerings together. Hallelujah. I trust this, me this message ministered unto you. You could tell I was cranked. You know, I was, it's, it's not an easy message to deliver, saints. There's a lot of nuances in there. But the Holy Ghost knows how to, how to do it. Been doing it for eons of time. Amen? And he'll be doing it for all eternity. Praise God forevermore. <coughs> You know, a lot of times um, people will go over my messages. You can take communion anytime. Every time you hear this, this message, you can take communion again and again. We do it every day here as a family. And there's nothing more powerful than, than taking the elements. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Those cups were like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. <laughs> Praise God. Alrighty. <clears throat> okay, okay, saints, take this bread and say this with me, Father, in Jesus' name. We heard the revelation of your word, Lord God. We are the body of Christ. We are min able ministers of the new covenant. <clears throat> in this new covenant, we are in union with the greater one who already is apt to change our vile body and change and bring it into the conformity to that of his glorious body. 
He's reconciling all things back unto himself, so our bodily organs represent and emulate Jesus, Jesus as he is now. Bone of his bone, flesh of all of his flesh, and as he is today, so are we in this world. All of our organs, tissues, and cells, everything within us, from top to bottom and inside and out, are covered by this glory, covered by this resurrection power. Resurrection power goes through every one of our genes, every one of our DNAs, every one of our cells, bringing us into this immortality, an everlasting life, and this Zoe is released from within us and ministers life unto our flesh and to those in and around us. Amen. This resurrection power also causes us to walk in to where it retains the everlasting life of Almighty God outside of our body, outside of our framework as well. Amen, saints? It maintains us into the prime of life. Prime of life. It's anti-death, anti-aging, anti-corruption, the glory and the resurrection power. Hallelujah. But it's pro-life and pro-glory, pro-resurrection power. Amen? Hallelujah. And so, Father, we thank you for all this. When we take this communion, acknowledging that we are in union with you, come into union, that's what communion means, have an, another celebration of union with me, celebrate it together of the power of this new covenant and this new testament that we have. We thank you, Father, for all this, by and through the blood of Jesus. Amen and amen. And may partake of the bread. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Let's you know, just meditate on how that, that bread is working through your members right now, bringing glory unto you. <clears throat> Take this cup in your hand, saints. And say this with me, Father, in Jesus' name, this cup of the New Testament is the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ who gives us an eternal redemption. Why? Because it wiped away our sins eternally as well. All sins, past, present, and future, are gone. They're eradicated. They no longer exist. Hallelujah. And Father, we sit before you in a state of absolute righteousness, innocence, and perfection based on your finished work. We are in Christ's righteousness, his innocence. We're all in his sinlessness as well, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God, that that's how you are. You put us in a body that is perfect, so therefore you would not put an imperfect body into that which is perfect and take that which would be perfect. So therefore, as he is perfect, so are we in this world perfect as well in him. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that the blood of the Lamb is all over our country, all over our community, all over our houses individually, protecting us from the eclipse tomorrow, and as well as everything else, and protecting our country from everything, all enemies, foreign and domestic, Lord God, and deliver us from evil as well as the nation of Israel. Protect them and the city of Jerusalem and all the inhabitants therein. His holy blood of Christ defeats the devil at every turn and overcomes the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. This heavy blood of Christ is over our eyes, nose, mouth, lips, fingers, and hands, protecting us from COVID issues, variants, respiratory issues, known and unknown, blue, bird flus, any other flu out there, and also any virus X. Everything is destroyed, eradicated, and we just thank you, Lord God, that we come into your conformity of perfection and wholeness and soundness. We praise you for that. We bless you. We thank you that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live the victorious life for us this day, spirit, soul, and body, financially, physically, socially, and economically. We have supernatural strength, endurance, focus, concentration, and ambition this day. And we go forth in the power of your spirit, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all these things. We thank, thank you for the power of the blood. Our words, Lord God, when we release resurrection words and power out of our mouth, they also ride on the blood of the Lamb. And we thank you, Lord, for all that. We give you the praise, honor, and the glory, Father, for all this. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may partake of the cup. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Get your tithes and offerings ready, saints. We'll do that now. And while you're waiting, you can turn also to uh, Psalm 91. <clears throat> Praise God forevermore. All right, so lay your hands on your own passbooks, your checking accounts, savings account, your own bill folds, all of it. You can even lay hands on your bills. 
Well, we would do this and pray for death cancellation over them and release that resurrection power into that. Right, saints? Here we go. Father, we take this basket of our tithes and offerings to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Apostle and High Priest after the order of Melchizedek, and over our profession. As he takes this and puts it down before the altar of the Father God, we enunciate and declare unto him that every, all of our giving today, Lord God, has been connected to every time we've ever given from the beginning of time to the end of time. And we receive a thousandfold blessing and the thousandfold return of all that giving now in Jesus' name. The wealth of the wicked has been exchanged to us the just. <clears throat> Amen. The silver, gold, and cattle of a thousand hills are ours today. We release our, our faith, Lord God, for total debt cancellation of all mortgage and credit card debt and any other debt known and unknown, school, college debt. Why? Because Jesus is our jubilee. We also thank you, Lord God, that this resurrection power goes into every one of my words, all of the words that we speak all day long. We speak resurrection life, Lord God, into the, the children's bank accounts, into their checkbooks, their savings accounts, Lord God, into everything that they own. And Lord, we also command every bill that they have to either be canceled or paid off in Jesus' name. We praise you for all that. We give you the glory for all that. We give you the thanksgiving for all that. And we send forth our angels under the power of God's anointing and resurrection power to go to the north, east, south, and west from expected and unexpected sources and bring in the financial resources <clears throat> and revenue for these last days and last times. We thank you, Lord God, that we have that. Angels, we command unto you, money cometh unto us now, today, tomorrow, and all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, receive it, receive it, through the resurrection of authority and power. See, the resurrection power came up, rose us up from the grave, saints. It rose us up, and it, we couldn't get out. Jesus couldn't get out until that financial prosperity comes came to us. I've been confessing it, and God's breaking loose all kinds of financial blessings on all of us. Amen? Believe it. Believe it. There's no, there's nothing that can stop resurrection power from accumulating power and bringing the wealth into the hands of the body of Christ, the church, the true owners and possessors of heaven and earth. Amen? Thank you, Lord, for that. Hallelujah. All right, now, saints, I'm going <clears> to <throat> we'll do the 91st Psalm, and then we'll do a closing prayer together. <clears throat> if you're in our Zoom room, it'll come up on the, the screen. If you're not in our Zoom room, you can tap in 1030 Eastern Time on Sundays, USA, and to our Zoom room for free. And if you're not there, you should be there. <laughs> Hallelujah, we would invite you in. And also, if you hear this through YouTube, Use your own tablets, Bibles, you know, phones, however. But the 91st Psalm will be there anyways. Ready? Here we go. We who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall lodge, abide, and stay under the shadow of El Shaddai. We do say the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress and my God, and Him do we trust. Surely has delivered us from the snare of the fowler, from the noise and pestilence. He's covered us with His feathers, and under His wings shall we trust. His truth is our shield and buckler. We're not afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the peasant that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at our side, and ten thousand at our right hand, but shall never come nigh us. All with our eyes should behold and see the reward of the wicked, because we've made the Lord, which is our refuge, even the Most High, our habitation. There shall no evil befall us, neither any plague come nigh our dwelling. For he has given his mighty angels charge over us to keep us in all thy ways. They shall bear us up in their hands, lest we dash our foot against the stone. We shall tread upon the lion, the adder, our young lion and dragon, shall we trample under feet, <clears throat> treading upon serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore have I delivered him. I have set him on high, because he hath known my name. He has called upon me, and I have answered him. I am with them in trouble. I have delivered them and honored them. With long life do I satisfy them, and show them my continued, ongoing, everlasting, perpetual, and supernatural salvation, which is our Jesus. Health, healing, wholeness, soundness, deliverance, preservation, safety and assurance, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, and all underneath the auspices of resurrection power. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. All right, saints, I have a closing prayer for the week. As the saints embark and disembark from here, Lord God, or wherever they are listening to this message, we just thank you that the heavy blood of Christ is over them, the hand of God is over them, the mercy, tender mercies, and traveling mercies are over them. The roads are blessed, Lord God. 
So above, beneath, and front, behind, they have the blood, the grace, the glory of Almighty God, and the angels of God encampeth around them, and above, and beneath, and and they go, but the Lord, they pass safely over to the other side and back continuously because the bloods are, of Jesus goes before them and the hand of God and the angels of God protecting the roads. We also pray for the unrighteous. Amen. So that they don't have any hindrance against you or me or anybody else for that matter. No accident leave us shall fall us or anybody, Lord God, no matter who it is. We thank you, Lord God, that as we put these teachings into manifestation and workable everyday affairs, we use this resurrection power all day long. I thank you, Lord God, as we go into work, resurrection power is going with me. I have resurrection power into my work today. It'll be easy. The grace will be there. The favor will be there. I release resurrection power again, you know, against, you know, into my bosses. Everything breaks my way. I release resurrection power on the roads before I drive. Resurrection power is on the roads, in my car. No matter where I go, the blood, the grace, and the glory has resurrection power surging through me. The glory, when I pray for people, resurrection power is coming out of me, and signs, wonders, and miracles happen. Amen, saints. Amen. Amen. And so, Father, we do this. We lift us up. We thank you, Lord God. And everybody within the sounds of my voice, Lord God, whether they hear this now or 10 years or 20 years from now, that resurrection power is still the same. We give you the thanksgiving and praise, Father. And we thank you that the saints are very astute. They, the, the saints are protected tomorrow for many um, possible adverse effects of the eclipse, and the whole nation is protected, and we command a, a cessation of earthquake activity, and we bind and break the power of the devil, and loosen the ministry of angels, Lord God, that are assigned to protect us, protect our homes, our possessions, and everything that we have, Lord God. We're divinely protected from destruction, and we thank you for your peace and your prosperity and your security, and we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory for it now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. Well, saints, thank you for another day, a time of participation with us here, allowing us to be your pastors, Spirit Word Ministries, and we also thank you for attending, and thank you for your uh, the favor that you grant unto us by your continued participation and due diligence and, and being loyal to God and His church and the pastor that He's put over you. And I also thank you, Lord God, for the prayers of the saints that they've given unto us and the blessings that they've given unto us, Lord God, through the ministration of their finances. And Lord, I also tell the saints, if you need anything, you know, ask me, text me, um, you know, email me, however you can do it, and we will lift up your situation before the throne room of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a good service today, saints, and I praise you for it. I bless you for it. I just thank the Lord for all these things, and I thank the Lord for you. So, we're going to unhook here, and I want to let everybody know that we see each other next week. You know, stay in His presence, peace, and rest, especially tomorrow. You know, pray in the Spirit hard, you know, and especially during the eclipse time. Be sensible. If you're going to go out and look at it, make sure you do have proper lenses to watch it. But either way, the glory of the Lord is all over you. Amen? So, until we meet again next week, uh, may God's richest and best be yours, and God's heavy blessing be upon you. In Jesus' name, love you, saints. See you next week. Bye-bye now.